Hi, it's Robin. Last year I made a couple videos about the penultimate plus two cartridge for the VIC-20. Nearly two hours of videos just to go through all the features packed into this amazing cartridge. And I still didn't cover it all. So watch those if you're interested. But a few highlights. It's a highly configurable RAM upgrade all the way up to 35k extra or 40k total, which is the maximum the VIC-20 can address, to play huge games like Realms of Quest V or Doom or whatever. It's also got loads of built-in games that start nearly instantly, lots of cartridge classics, but also some neat and obscure games that have been converted from cassette to run on this cartridge. It also has diagnostic programs to help check that your VIC-20 is working properly, and lots of utilities, and even development tools. And again, I covered many of those in the previous videos, which will be linked in the video description. Okay, but now it's had a refresh for 2024 with even more features. So we'll be looking at those today. Externally, it looks about the same, but there's one new feature you can only see when it's powered up. Okay, so I'll just plug the cartridge into the back of the VIC-20 here. Close up time. We power it up. Okay, and it boots up to the main menu here. This is largely the same as the previous version, but it does have a few changes. But just while I have the camera close up, I just want to show you the, uh, the main external change. If we go into the settings menu, there's a whole bunch of extra options here. Okay, but what I want to look at first is just this boot to random game feature. Now I'll press return. I'll just watch the upper right LED. It turns blue. Okay, and we've got Mastertronic New York Blitz here. Okay, so the light is normally red, and that means it's in this reset or restart mode. But when it's blue, you see it matches the color coding here. Pretty cool, eh? Random game if it's blue. So if we click a blue, the blue LED turns red briefly. It restarts. Loading number nabber. <laughs> it's blue. So anyway, I think that's pretty cool. Especially just how it matches the uh, legend there. It's this. Oh, Galaxian. This is the official Atari Galaxian that's not nearly as good as the one that Satoru Iwata wrote for HAL Laboratory, but uh, became Star Battle internationally. It was only Galaxian in Japan. One more. Ooh, squish them. And to get out of that, just press the green menu button. And back into settings. And tell it to boot to menu again. And they'll go back to the regular mode with the red reset. Okay, so here we are back at the main menu. The main new things are that this utilities menu has been split off. A separate development tools menu has been added just to make room for more new things. And also more games have been added. So I know some of my audience is mainly interested in the games and some don't care about the games at all and just want to see the development tools. So we're going to start with the games today. And for those of you who aren't interested, that's what I put chapter indexes in for in every one of my videos. Just jump ahead to the part you're interested in. So we'll go in here into the games A to Z menu, and we'll try a few of the new ones. Alien Invaders caught my eye. So I noticed this was called Alien Invaders in the menu, but on screen it's called Alien Invasion. And that's actually how I've known it when I saw that it was by D. Bucci, and I realized that Davide actually sent me this game that he made on cassette way back, was it 2018 or even earlier? There it is. Look, even made like really nice art for it. And a cassette inlay. Earth is under attack. You are our last hope. Look, he even signed it for me. I've got copy number two of three. Talk about rare. Yep. 
Grandavide, I believe that's how you say David in Italian, July 2nd, 2018. How about that? I don't even remember why he sent it to me. I think I probably helped playtest it or something or made some suggestions. But super generous of you. Thank you, Davide. But anyway, here it is on the cartridge now. My joystick here. So basically the game is like Space Invaders. Uh, but kind of like really, I don't know, I want to say amped up. Just kind of more intense. Like you got auto fire here. I'm blowing away my platforms. <laughs> Normally I would play this game a lot more strategically, but... Anyway, I think it's pretty fun. You won. We have the top score. Um, it does seem to get cut off on NTSC a bit, but hey, everything important for actually playing the game is still visible. It's got auto fire, which is pretty nice. I don't have to keep hammering the fire button. So if you kind of like Space Invaders, but you find traditional Space Invaders too slow paced or plodding, uh, you might want to check this one out. Of course, I should be focusing more on knocking out those end guys. Really nice smooth scrolling too. Smooth movement for the aliens. Remember that there's no sprites on this. Uh, the Vic 20. Or speed scrolling for that matter. All right. And you can hold down shift and just press the letter to shortcut to it. Although A comes up first, shift A. Try Atlantis here. It's pretty cool because this is the prequel to one of my favorite Atari 2600 games ever. This is called Atlantis. It's F1 to start. So a different kind of shooter. You have those two bases at the side, you push left or right to shoot. I'm not doing too good. Oh, there. Ah, he's blown up my cities, my underwater cities of Atlantis. Anyway, I think it's really cool that uh, a lot of these games, if you're familiar with the Atari 2600 or Atari VCS, that it was kind of neat that a bunch of those games were ported to the VIC-20 and sometimes they did a really good job with them. Sometimes beating the Atari. Vic 20 was more powerful in most ways. Ah! It's easier to type on. Just got that one city left. A little bit like Missile Command meets a uh, well, more traditional shooter. Ah! Yeah, they blew up all my cities. Uh, that was game over. Shift F to go into F, and here's this new one called Fall. And this is by, I just realized I've never said his name before. Majikarik, Majikarik, I guess. Well, yeah, this one doesn't use the joystick. Instead, you press Z or N to jump. I think you have to use both. Okay, I actually practice. This is this game is brutal. Pre be prepared for me to do terribly. You are controlling oh, both of these guys at once. So Z makes them jump back and forth in the left edge, and N on the right. And you got to keep both guys alive. Oh. 
It's a little graphic, eh? I guess this would get an M rating if it was, uh... Oh, it's so hard to do both of these at once. Oh, oh, there. At least I got double digits. I got 11. That might be the best I do. Oh. <laughs> See, guys... Oh, this game is so tough. Oh, yeah, it's... If you can mirror uh, the actions, if you get lucky enough, then it gets a lot... It's a lot easier. No! Oh! I don't know if this might look easy. I find this so difficult. You might think, nah, Robin can't play video games. Oh, oh, 15. Okay, that is my best. I think it's a really cool game, just brutally difficult. I like those very simple games, so that... That would make a good iPhone game. What's another one? Shift O Operation Ganymede. Ganymede. Ganymede? Which is that? That's is that one of the moons of uh it's the moon of Jupiter? Your lunar module is low on fuel, and your mission is to unload badly needed supplies on the remote moon colony. Okay, press shift. You can only land once on each of the sites. Okay, I think I'll use the joystick. Okay, so this is like Jupiter Lander, but worse. It's kind of lacking that uh, physics feel. Ooh, I did okay there. Okay, so now the landing pad is covered with... What is that like? Crashed pieces of ship. What did they put on there? Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> it just doesn't have that sense. Uh, I find how Laboratories Jupiter Lander just is a better game. These huge sprites and just better. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Usually I'm pretty good at these kind of games, but this one just doesn't have the right feel. It's potentially cool, like, it's not terrible. <sighs> okay. Is anyone good at that one? Does anyone prefer that one to, uh, Jupiter Lander. What are we gonna try? Oh yeah, and here one one more game. They've added Moon Patrol now. And I really like this. It looks a bit funny, but it's pretty fun to play. Not the best looking Moon Patrol. Not, not the best looking Moon Patrol ever. Moon Patrol ever, but it's uh, plays pretty good. Caution. What for? Oh, yep. Yeah. Some UFOs. Oh, I jumped too early? Oh, no, oh, no, no, okay. I like how the tires bounce up and down, even, oh. <laughs> Pretty good without sprites.
Oh. Checkpoint. One of these made holes when they dropped those bombs. There. Got to the first checkpoint. Time to reach point E. Your time, 84. Average time, 80. Top. Record, no speed bonus. It's actually slowing down quite a bit now. I don't remember doing that. Okay. Okay, so I think there's quite a few more games, so that's enough of that for today. You get the idea. Lots of games. Actually, I'll just scroll through here again real quick. And you can pause it and look and see if a particular game you want to play is on here. Just note these are all just the NTSC compatible games. There are additional games that will appear if you're on a PAL machine. And you can bring those up by pressing P. And I'll press that. See where there's an X, that means it doesn't work on NTSC. Certain parts of the alphabet seem uh, NTSC adverse. Okay, there. Okay, I'm going to go back to the main menu. Okay, so I was mentioning here in the utilities menu, this was all that was on earlier versions of this cartridge. I've already demonstrated all those in previous videos, but what's happened now is the development tools, or press V for a shortcut for dev, now gets its own menu. Okay, Vicmon is included, and that was there before, but here's one of the new ones, Programmer's Aid. We'll give that a try. And note it says, start with sys28681. And you do have to do that, sys28681. And there, Programmer's Aid kicks in. And that's just like what the original cartridge required too. If you had the actual original one from Commodore that only did Programmer's Aid, I think you still had to start it with a sys command. So Commodore offered two different VIC-20 Programmer's cartridges, which is kind of weird. There was one called Super Expander, and we've looked at that before. That adds a bunch of graphics and sound commands and that sort of thing. Programmer's Aid was the other one, and instead it really expands the editing capabilities. Like it makes the actual process of programming easier. It doesn't give you fancy graphics or sound commands. Instead, it gives you utilities to deal with your program while editing it. So it's too bad they couldn't squeeze both of those on one cartridge, but it, it is a limitation of the ROM size and the memory map of the VIC. And the bonus on the Penultimate Plus is that it includes RAM expansion. So that's why you have about 20K RAM free and the Programmer's Aid active together. While on a regular VIC-20, you'd have to buy an extra expansion to be able to plug in RAM and the Programmer's Aid cartridge at the same time. So I won't go super in depth, but I'll give you a little idea of what's available in these. I want to point out that almost everything I'm showing you today, I should have said this at the beginning, the Penultimate Plus cartridge is super cool, but almost all the things I'm showing you today can be done without one. If you hunt around on the internet, you can find the files and you could burn your own EEPROMs or, you know, there, there's other ways of accessing a lot of this software. You could do it in an emulator. I'm not saying that because I don't think you should get the penultimate. I think it's excellent. But I just want you to know that you don't have to buy this to do most of the things we're looking at today. It's just super handy to have them all in one place, though. Okay, so the Programmer's Aid starts in program mode. 
And if you just type the key command, it shows you what each of the function keys are given a shortcut. So key one corresponds to F1, and that'll get bring up list. I'll show that if I press F1, it automatically displays list. And it's the same for all 12 of these instructions. It's the normal F1 through F8. And I would have thought it was the commoner key you'd use to get the next four functions, but actually it's control. So if you hold down control and press F1, then you get the equivalent of F9, which will switch us to edit mode, I believe. Yep, there we go. Okay, so what's the difference between program mode and edit mode? All it really is, I won't be able to fit these all on the same screen, but if we just type the key command again, you see that you get some different features here. For example, in program mode, F6 gives you write string, but gives you the change instruction now that we are in edit mode. So really this adds this program mode and edit mode, but I think the only thing it really does is changes the set of shortcuts. 12 of these shortcuts in program mode are more program oriented commands like write string input, but so on. And in edit mode, they're more focused on editing your program such as list, and you can see a bunch of the new commands that are added, delete, find, change, trace, step, renumber, merge, and that's what we'll be looking at briefly here. Okay, so one command. I know there's the shortcuts, but actually I don't find them all that useful. You have to remember where they are. I just find it easier just to type them in. <laughs> so if we type in auto 10, it'll do automatic line numbers. Just so you don't have to type in the line numbers yourself. Ram this, ram is, ram, that means remark or comment, a test. And just hit enter for the blank line. Okay, so there's our little useless program. This is a test. Now we can renumber if we want to. So let's go renumber and you tell the starting line number and it defaults to renumbering by 10. So if I list now that I've renumbered from 100, you see now it's at line number 100. And I could even go like renumber 200 comma 100. Now each line goes up by 100. And there's a delete command that allows you to delete a range of lines. So we can delete from 200 to 400. And that leaves only line 500. Without that, you just have to delete each line number just by typing it in on its own, like so. Now, while I still have that on the screen, I'll put those back in. There's also a command called find, and we can just go find the text is, and it prints out each line where it finds that because is is a substring in the word this, it printed that out and also of course line 300 and you can also find rem statements or whatever you wish that could be pretty handy in a long program and if you want to change occurrences this is like just a search and replace this is almost like having a modern text editor so you can change is to ip and now if we list Vip ip a test. Okay, now if we have a program like this, ram error test, and if we poke, what's a good error? If we poke a number like location 70,000, comma 11, that's not a valid poke. So if we run it, we get an illegal quantity error in 20. But if you need a bit of help figuring out where the error is, in case you really didn't know, you type the word help and it'll show the line number where the error was, but also highlight where it thinks the error occurred. And that's like that last digit is in reverse saying, look, that is too big a number. That extra digit is what pushed it over the edge. So that's potentially cool. Another one, if we had a little program like, I don't know, A, B equals 20, C equals A, plus B, and if you run that program, it doesn't do anything but set those variables, then you can dump those variables 
and it will print them all out in the order they're defined. A is 15, B is 20, and C, the total, is 35. So that could also be handy for debugging. And if we have a little program like for A equals, what, 1 to 10, 20, B equals B plus A, 30, next, and then we print out B at the end, 55. Okay, but say you somehow got confused about how that program, uh, what, the, what the flow of it was, you can turn on trace mode and then run. And you see up in the corner, it actually showed all the line numbers in that little window. It finally got to line 40 at the end, but you can see 20, 30, 20, 30. That scrolled by really quick. If you run, if you hold down control, you can see the line numbers as they're processed at a slower rate. If that's still too slow for you, then you can type the step command instead. Just uh, clear the screen, it's gotten a bit messy. And if I run that, now it shows that we're on line 10. And if we tap control, well, it did a few at once, but anyway, process line 20, 30, and then it loops back. Actually, it's interesting. It doesn't go back to line 10, but that's actually true. That's how 4next works. So you see, it's just going back and forth between line 20 and 30. And there, it's done line 40. So that's potentially handy. And if you type off, then the trace goes away. I notice it doesn't get rid of the window, but it won't refresh the window. It'll just scroll off the screen. So if we run the program again, you see it doesn't do the trace anymore. If you want to make a little library of routines, so maybe we'll do a big line number like 10,000 rem print high return. Okay, so that's the very useful high routine. And what I'm going to do is just save that off to disk. Just call it high. Saving that on my SD card. Okay, so we don't have a program in memory. And we'll do something like go sub 10,000 20 end and run that. Okay, saying that we have an undefined statement. There is no routine at line 10,000 right now. Well, I don't want to go all the trouble of typing in that high subroutine anymore from my library. So instead, we can use this new command called merge, merge high. Okay, it loads into memory. And if we list, there is both my program that was in memory, and there's the routine that we pulled from disk. So that could be actually very useful. And if we run that, look, it works now. Hi. <laughs> this is goofy examples, but I think they illustrate what you can do with it. Okay, now if we load in a big program, well, this doesn't even work, but uh, <laughs> here's that pet game. That I made a video about recently called Manbiki Shonen. Apparently that Y, you're still supposed to pronounce it kind of like an H. Okay, so here's this pet game. It won't even work on the VIC. The basic is compatible, but the pokes and the screen formatting are all wrong. So it won't actually run it, but I'm still able to load it in. I just want to load in a large program. I want to show a few other editing features that this has. If you hold down control and press Q, you notice the cursor is going up. And here up at line 978, and you see, look at that. You can actually scroll up through a program listing and it just automatically scrolls. Now that's super nice because normally you can't do that in Commodore Basic. Instead, you have to just list the range number and you got Madge keeping on the screen. If it scrolls off, tough luck. Okay, and A also works, but the, it gets a little goofy. Like, I don't think it's missing any lines, but I don't really know why the formatting's that weird. But up works really nice. <laughs> I'm sure that isn't a problem with the penultimate. That's just kind of the weirdness of this. 
Yeah. Anyway, even though it's a bit ugly scrolling down, it still seems like it could be useful. So yeah, normally here I do this like that. And just a few other editing features. If you're part way in a line, and you just say, oh no, I don't want it to be that anymore. Control L will wipe out the rest of the logical line from that point on. So you see it blanked out all that, but it does actually change the program until you press return. If you want to wipe out the whole logical line, like here, 3000 is three lines long, then control U will get rid of that. Here it goes. There. And puts the cursor up on the top left corner. Actually, if you decide you want to get rid of everything below the cursor, then control N. So those are handy low features. Oh, and one other you can count. So quote mode, if you've ever been like this, you go print quote and you go hello. And then you start cursoring left and you go, ah, my cursor's not working. Okay, well, actually, you can just hold down shift and return to get out of that, but maybe even slightly better, hold down with the programmer's aid, control E, and now you can just move about freely. It, it turns off quote mode, which is really meant for inserting control codes into strings. It's a powerful feature, but it's also very quirky. Okay, that's it for programmer's aid. A nice little addition to the penultimate. Back to the menu. Let's look at the next one. Okay, this wax assembler. Again, it tells you activate with sys40960. Just start it up here, 40960. And there we go, it gives a URL. So this is actually a new project or last number of years. So beigemaze.com slash, and this is wax 2.1. So if you're searching for documentation, I'll actually put a link in the video description. I accidentally ended up with the documentation for wax one. And it was really confusing till I realized that the old wax one documentation is still online, but there's quite a few changes in two. So don't fall for that. Okay. I'll put a link to the GitHub for this project. Wax is an open source product released under the MIT license. It was crafted to be the finest native assembler for the VIC-20 that no money can buy. I hope you enjoy it by Jason Justian. And I think it was updated as recently as 2023. Okay, so he's actually got a tutorial online and I thought I'd just work through part of that as a good way of explaining it. So all credit to Jason, both for writing this assembler and for this tutorial that I'm going to uh, dramatically reenact. With most native VIC-20 machine language monitors, you're either running the monitor or you're in BASIC. WAX isn't like that. WAX is a system of tools bound together by a common interface that runs as a BASIC extension. It integrates seamlessly into the VIC-20's native environment, providing a great deal of agility. It's a machine language monitor that works with you. If you've used other native VIC-20 assemblers like VICMON or HESMON, much will be familiar, but Wax does a lot of extra things. So whether you're new to Wax or upgrading Wax 2, the following tutorial will get you up to speed. All Wax tools start with a period. The tools command comes after the period, actually after any number of periods. In most cases, parameters follow the command, depending on what the tool does. Once you've started Wax, try the following. Dot, question mark. This is the help tool. It displays a list of all wax tools. Each of these can be invoked by entering a period, the command, and usually one or more parameters. So dot R, this shows the register display and the cursor is now flashing after a period, the wax prompt. Most tools will finish by showing some kind of prompt. This is there for convenience. So that dot doesn't mean that you're in wax. You never left the VIC-20's basic environment. That is, we're in basic right now. It's just automatically putting that dot prompt for you. Makes it feel kind of like you're in the monitor, but really you're just in basic. And these dot commands are add-ons. Now enter this, okay. D, E, A, B, F. Okay, you might recognize this bit of code as part of the VIC-20's interrupt handler. You'll notice that in addition to the wax prompt, the cursor is flashing over the D command. 
Invoking D with nothing after it will display the next 16 lines of code and then pause. Okay, so you can just work through that way. You can keep doing that. What you can also do, interestingly, is if you hit return and then press shift, it will continue to disassemble as long as you hold it. And then if you hold down control, it will slow things down. That's pretty interesting that you can do that. As soon as you let go of shift, the disassembly stops. Okay, you can also disassemble a range of code from 0073 to 0088. That's a little bit of code that actually handles the input buffer. Note that you have to put even zero page addresses as full 16 bit values like this. If you don't, if you just go from 73 to 8A, like the Super Snapshot Monitor allows, interprets that as 738A, it combines those, it ignores the spaces in between. That is probably due to it using Commodore's parser, but that's not a big deal. You can get out of the prompt, you can just type X if you want, but again, all that does is gets rid of the automatic dot prompt. You're really in basic the whole time. You can also just delete the dot and you're out. You can even press shift return like we talked about before. Okay, now to assemble dot A, location 1800 hex, and we can load A with 2A hex. And you see it automatically advances to the next address. So we can write a little program like that. and just pressing return on the line exit. So the assembly mode, and now we can execute the code with go 1800. And there it printed out, what is that? 16 asterisks. We can disassemble that. So here's that code that we assembled and you can just go along here and edit this. Just say 5C is what the tutorial suggests. Go 1800. Whoops, I forgot the uh, dot prompt there. Dot go. And it prints a bunch of pounds, pound symbols. Okay, now the neat thing is that you can actually do this inside of BASIC. So let's type new to be sure. Line 10 dot A, symbol to 1900, increment. 900F. When you're entering this into basic, it won't automatically do the rest of the work for you, but that's okay. 1903, jump to 1900. If we run that, it has assembled that into memory. And now we can start the program. Uh, the decimal 6400 decimal is the same as 1900 hex. And oh, yeah, I should have warned you, that's a bit glitchy. Well, that's just incrementing the background and border color register, which are shared on the VIC-20. So you see, you can actually put assembly right into a basic program. And when you run it, it doesn't execute the assembly, it assembles it. Okay, but you can do more complicated things. Like if you do a variable like S equals 6400, then you can assemble and that means insert the contents of that variable into that location. It's like a macro. Line 30. And star is what's called the command pointer. It's where you would currently assemble to. At L is a label. Label A. Line 40. Branch if not equal to back to that label. 50. And you can even jump to the contents of that basic variable. And then we can disassemble the program starting from S to A, which is where the assembly finished. Let's see if that works. I'm going to list that. Uh, I'm going to clean that up by inserting space there. Okay, so if we run that, it's actually assembled into memory at 6400 decimal, or that is 1900 hex. And this is where it's done the assembly. And then we've told it to disassemble from 
that same starting location to wherever we ended up finishing assembly. So there's our program right there. Uh, it's done one extra command because after we're done, star always points to the next free spot to assemble to. So by doing that, I wonder if it lets us do star minus one. Oh, no, no. Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so apparently the labels can only be one character long. But even just from that, I can see that this is pretty powerful. Okay, so we'll start this program. It might flicker again. So this time it's incrementing that background border color register, but it's also waiting for location A2. It only advances when A2 is equal to zero, and that's part of the Jiffy counter that we've looked at in other videos. So basically it's only changing every, I think it's about four seconds, every uh, 256 Jiffies. A Jiffy is a 60th of a second on these Commodore machines. Okay, hold down stop and restore to exit that. There's a couple other examples here. If we set the assembly location to 1800 and .a, and we assemble load A with the character, with the exclamation character for I equals one to 10. This is where we can use basic as sort of a scripting language and have it generate code. So again, this isn't really mixing at runtime basic and assembly, but instead it's using the basic as a scripting language for the assembler. I will list that. So it's loading the accumulator with an exclamation mark and that's doing a loop here. Oh, you know what? I missed. I have to put the star there to tell it to actually assemble to the command pointer. Okay. So it's going to do a loop 10 times. It's kind of going to emit, I guess is the right word, a JSR FFD2, which prints a character. So this is not the most efficient code. Okay, but now if I run it, it will assemble it. Good. Now if we disassemble from 1800 to the command pointer, you can see the code that it generated. That's the character code for the exclamation mark. And you see there's 10 FFD2s, and that's kind of a waste of, uh, <laughs> this isn't the most efficient way, but it's just illustrating the example of how if you want to generate a bunch of code automatically, this is how you can do it in a loop. And then return. Okay, and then we should be able to go 1800. And there, printed out 10 exclamation marks. Back to direct assembling. A couple other things you can do. You can load A with the low byte of label T and load Y with the high byte of label T and then jump to CB1E. That is the print string routine in the basic ROM and return. And now we can do that label T and we can just define some text like this. Hello world. And then we can just put some bytes in like some hex bytes and return. Okay, so this label T now refers to our text string of hello world. And we can refer to the lower high byte of that label. And that's even a forward reference to it. You see label T is not defined yet at this point. It's a head. So it's actually smart enough to figure out how to do this. Okay, and let's see if that works. Oh, forgot the dot in front. There we go. Hello world. Okay, so there's a lot more to this assembler. Uh, if you're really interested in it, I'd almost revisit this in another video sometime, but the manual seems really good. And again, check it out if you're interested in this and let me know if you want to see more. This is pretty neat. This may be the best native assembler for the VIC-20 that <laughs> has made. It seems pretty powerful. And really, the competition isn't all that great. If, if you watched my previous video, I think it was called VicKit 4 or 5. I think it was 4 that 
was a native VIC-20 assembler, and oh, it was so quirky. This is way more normal, even though this is a little weird. This seems much, much better. So, good job, Jason. Okay, and the one last thing we're going to look at today, still going to be a long video, yet another hour of penultimate. Okay, and the one other thing that they added was this Waterloo Structured Basic. Okay, and this is a neat cartridge. Waterloo is the university here in Canada, one of the premier, probably the premier math and computer science university of Canada. They really got on board with Commodore in those early days. They even developed the Super Pat, and they made this Waterloo Basic for the VIC-20. The original, not, not the penultimate, but the Waterloo Basic official cartridge was, it seems, was only sold by Commodore Canada, and they didn't even talk to Commodore USA and certainly not Commodore Japan because they gave it the model number VIC-1001. I, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. It doesn't follow Commodore's normal convention. Like we've got the 1900 series and the 1200 and the so on for the cartridges. But especially VIC-1001, that's the model number of the original VIC-20 in Japan. Before the VIC-20 came out in the U.S. or anywhere else, Japan got an almost identical computer called the VIC-1001. I don't know why. Commodore Canada reused that model number for this Waterloo cartridge, which is super obscure. I've never seen one in real life. But anyway, here it is on the penultimate, ready to use. <laughs> so really all they've done is extend regular Commodore BASIC and only in a few ways. It's this structured basic idea. Actually, I think it has like three different names. It's just called Waterloo Basic here. The box said structured basic. On the cartridge, it says Waterloo structural basic. <laughs> it's not like that. At least some of the time they try to get this point of it being structured across. Rather than being spaghetti code, it gives you some extra commands to avoid that spaghetti. So let's look at that. Uh, so we'll just write a program. So instead of using go to's, you can use this loop structure. And they've also done a nice thing here of allowing you to indent your programs. And normally, well, you can type all the indents you want, but Commodore Basic just strips them out normally. But they've modified Basic to allow that. Okay, so here we've just made a program loop and end loop will go back to the loop and it'll just keep incrementing a and printing it out so it's just like an endless loop so we'll run that and you see it's just running and counting up we're already up to 115 and so on okay so that replaces the normal line where we would go say here go to 10 or go to 20 and see how it did preserve the indenting here. So line 35, we can go if a equals 10. Let's say we want to throw out a lot of the examples today. We're going to count from 1 to 10. Okay, so if a equals 10, then quit. Well, that's a bit ugly, eh? You know what? I'm just going to do an indent of 1. Got rid of the line wrap. VIC-20 has a small screen for sure. So if A equals 10, then quit. So we'll run that. The quit command is added to escape from whatever current structure you're in. Didn't really notice before how that I is centered in, in the huge VIC-20 font. That I is so far to the right compared to where, you know, here next to the A, the P. <laughs> it's almost, they should have shifted at least one pixel to the left, but anyway. Okay, but another way of doing that, if we get rid of that line 35, which is fine, sometimes you need that kind of quit command. Well, let's get rid of that one. Let's replace line 10, and the opening loop can be changed into a while. While A is less than 10, then it will allow these things to happen, and once A is not less than 10, it will exit that entire structure. Okay, so let's run that. Well, you see, we've printed 
1 through 10 again. The reason we do it while a is less than 10 is because there's one more increment before the last print. You might have thought we have to do less than or equal to 10. That would actually allow this to go up to 11. Okay, or we can put that loop back. If we want to have the condition checked at the end instead, we can do until a equals 10, and we'll run that. Okay, so it again prints from 1 to 10. You can even combine uh, while and until if you really wanted to, I guess. While a is less than 10, this is, this is silly, but I think it will work okay, yeah. But there might be cases where you want to check for a condition before you even enter the loop, because you might not want to run in some cases even a single iteration, and then the until checks at the end. So that's the only difference. Now, of course, our old way of doing uh, for next loops is still available for a equals one to 10. That's kind of nice how we can do an indent here. Print a. And next. And I just wanted to point out that you can't use the quit inside a for next loop. Say we want to quit just if it's a is five. If a equals five, then quit. So we'll run that. And it gets up to five, but then it says unmatched structure error. I think it's because this for next is built into Commodore Basic. It's not one of the Waterloo structures that they've added. So this quit doesn't work with it. Just wanted to point that out. Okay, and how about a big example, like line 100 for a equals 100 to 5, step minus 5, line 110. So how about we do a little program that tells you what your mark is here, gives you a letter grade based on percentage. So a normal Commodore Basic, this would get quite ugly. Uh, I guess you could say it still looks ugly compared to modern ones, but anyway, <laughs> it's, I think it's better. We can use this if else structure and actually if else if else and end if. Anyway, we'll we'll get to it here. I'm talking too much. If A is greater than 90, that's an A plus. I think this might have been a weird Ontario thing here where I grew up, that a 90 was considered an A plus, an 80 is an A. Anybody else have that weird marking scheme? Grade letters. I know people do this different all the time. So anyway, yeah, there's this else if command. And it's one word. You can't put a space between it. Okay. Let's uh, speed this up a bit with 170. B line 180. Else if A is greater than 60. I'm just reusing some line numbers here. I hope I don't uh, mess it up. Line 200. Else if A is greater than 50. 210. That's a D. Whoop. Let's see where we are so far. That looks right. Line 220. Else. Line 30. Print. Fail. 240. And if. 250. Next. I'm just going to list that to make sure. So you get the idea here that we're doing a four next loop from getting 100% down to five, stepping by negative five each time. It's just going to print out the score and tell you what the grade is. Oh, I forgot a semicolon there. And then for each case, it's going to check is how about if A is greater than or equal to 90, and it's going to print that you got an A plus. If it's greater than or equal to 80, then a regular A. 70 is a B, 60, I guess it's confusing. I used variable A, I should have done like P or S or something, I guess. Oh, well, too late. C, else if A is greater than 50, you get a D. And else, this is the last case. So you see, only one of these will execute each time. And then else, it just prints a fail. And then end if lets it know that you are done. Let's see, does this work? Yeah. Oh, I put grad that whole time. Are you shouting at me? <laughs> grad. Is grad. There we go. 100% is grade A+. Plus. 95 is A+. Plus. 
90 is A+. plus. Boy, it's easy to get an A+. Plus. 85 is A. Yeah. And then 45 or below is a fail. I just didn't put zero because it was scrolled off the top of the screen here. Push my 100 off. <laughs> Anyways, that's a dumb example. I just couldn't think of anything else. Okay, I got one more example here. Line 100. And we're going to do a loop. And what's this one for? For the procedure. A equals A plus 1. 120. Call display until B. 140. Let's do an and. And just to allow a blank line, if you, you got to put a colon or something on it. Uh, as space friendly as Waterloo Basic is, you still can't do an empty line as, as far as I know anyway. Okay, and line 200, procedure display. Okay, and we'll print out A. If A is 10, B equals 1, and if, and proc. Okay, so this is what's called a procedure, and you can call procedures by name. So this seems cool, but it's almost just a perfect replacement for go sub. Call is go sub, but instead of a line number, you can give a name. But as far as I can tell, it doesn't support any parameter passing. So really, display just can get mapped to line 200. When it looks it up, it's basically the same as go sub 200. Except, of course, the line number can change. It's, it, it is a little bit better, but it really isn't a, like much better. An end proc might as well just be a return from a go sub. And that, that's it. So I'm not as impressed with this. If they had added uh, a way of adding parameters to procedures, like uh, local variables, that would be pretty neat. But it doesn't do that. So anyway, we'll just run the program. Did I do it right? Yep, yeah, 1 through 10. B by default is zero, so until B will cause the loop to keep occurring until you set B to any value that's non-zero, and then it'll fail and the program will end. So that's a little tidier too, eh? Like until B, until B is true. Okay, so that's Waterloo Basic, and I think we're just about done. Last thing is just to look at that settings menu again. We did that random game already. There are quite a few new boot options here. If you want your penultimate to behave like a certain cartridge right when you power up your computer, this is where you do it. So, you know, we just did that Waterloo Basic. Boot to Waterloo Basic. And it reprograms it. And now, even if you just turn off your computer completely and power up, It just comes straight up into Waterloo Basic. So that's a neat little feature. And you can undo that just by going into settings and here back to boot to menu. That's yet another look at the penultimate plus. And so maybe that's giving you some things to look at. Even if you don't get a penultimate, might be something there that you want to play around with on your own VIC-20 or even some of those ideas may transfer over to the Converse 64. So thanks very much to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Game.